Chapter 5 is about making connections efficient, multiplexing, and compression. The objectives after, after reading this chapter, you should be able to describe frequency division multiplexing and list its applications, advantages, and disadvantages. Describe Synchronous time division multiplexing, TDM, and list its applications for advantages and disadvantages. Outline the basic multiplexing characteristics of T1 and SONET SDS telephone system. Describe statistical time division multiplexing and list its application advantages and disadvantages. Cite the main characteristics of wavelength decision multiplexing and its advantages and disadvantages. Describe the basic characteristics of discrete multitone. Cite the main characteristics of code division multiplexing CDM and its advantages and disadvantages. Apply multiplexing techniques to a typical business situation. Describe the difference between Lucy and lossless compressions. Describe the basic operation of run length, JPEG, and MP3 compression. And here is the introduction. We'll just go through it. Frequency division multiplexing, FDM. As the assignment of non-overlapping frequency ranges to each user of a medium. And we have the term channel as an assigned set of frequencies that is used to transmit the user signal. Then we have assignment of frequencies for cable television channel low band vhf cable channel frequency mid band cable and here is the channels and here is the frequency range and high band vhf channel all right Other common examples of frequency division multiplexing are cell phone systems. These systems divide the bandwidth that is available to them into multiple channels. Thus, the telephone connection of one user is assigned one set of frequencies for transmission, while telephone connection of a second user is assigned a second set of frequencies. And now we have a device called multiplexer. The device that accepts input from one or more users is called the multiplexer. The device attached to the receiving end of the medium and splits off signal to deliver it to the appropriate receiver is called the second multiplexer or D multiplexer. So we have two devices, multiplexer and the multiplexer. Simplified example of frequency division multiplexing, FDM. FDM radio stations and towers transmit different on different channels and the listener receives one at a time. Guard band. To keep one signal from interfering with another signal, a set of unused frequencies called a guard band is usually inserted between the two signals to provide a form of insulation, just like a cushion, just like a, a space, a safe area, all right? And that was the FDM. And now we have the TDM, time division multiplexing, allows only one user at a time to transmit. And the sharing of a medium is accomplished by dividing available transmission time among 
users. So they share time and time division multiplexing and they share frequencies when they use FDM, frequency division multiplexing. Now, TDM is the most, is most recent, is most modern. Synchronous time division multiplexing. Sync TDM gives each incoming source signal a turn to be transmitted, proceeding through a sources in a round ribbon fashion. Several cash register and their multiplexed stream of transactions. Cash register, cash register, cash register, a multiplexer binds among across high speed link, demultiplexer, and a server. Multiplexer transmission stream with only one input device transmit data. So it's one at a time. Transmitted frame with added synchronization bits. Synchronization bit. Okay. TI multiplexing. Multiplex digital data and digitized voice into high speed telephone line with a data rate of this per second. The T1s, T1, not TI, T1. Original purpose was to provide high speed connection between AT&T switching centers. In TI multiplexing, the frame of TI multiplexers output stream are divided into 24 separate digitized voice data channels of 64 bit, 64 kilobits per second each. So this is the TI or T1 multiplex data stream divided into bytes each as 24 sync bit and here is some details about the ti or t1 multiplexing t1 multiple communication lines are a popular technology for connecting business to high-speed sources such as internet service providers and other wide area networks because ti multiplexing is a classic example of synchronous time division so it's a synchronous time division multiplexing It merits further examination. All right. Then we have the Sonnet SDH multiplexing. Sonnet synchronized, synchronous optical network. Sonnet synchronous optical network. And synchronous digital hierarchy, SDH are powerful standards for multiplexing data streams over a single medium. Sonnet developed in the United States by NC and SDH developed by Europe by ITU T are two almost identical standards for high bandwidth transmission of a wide range of data over fiber optic cable Sonnet and SDH have two features that are of a particular interest in the context of multiplexing. First, they are both synchronous and multiplexing, synchronous multiplexing techniques. A single clock controls the timing of all transmission and equipment across the entire Sonnet or SDH network. Sonnet defines a hierarchy of signaling level or data transmission rates called synchronous transport signals, STS.
and we have STS level 1, 3, 9, 12, 18, and so on. The OC specification, OC1, OC3, OC9, and so on. Data rates in bits, in megabits per second, 51, and goes up. In megabits per second. So this is 9,935.28 megabits per second. And this is really fast. Sonnet STS iframe layout. Section overhead, line overhead, path overhead, then the data. So it has lots of overhead. Statistical time division multiplexing. As you have seen in preceding discussions, both frequency division multiplexing and synchronous time division multiplexing can waste and use transmission space. They have a waste. The FDM and the synchronous TDM. One solution to this problem, to solve that waste problem, is statistical time division multiplexing. It uses statistics, sometimes called asynchronous time division multiplexing. Asynchronous. The, the previous one was synchronous TDM, now asynchronous TDM, or it's called statistical TDM, or stat TDM. Transmits data only from active users that does not transmit and does not transmit empty time slots. So they don't consume the bandwidth for nothing, for empty. And this is really smart. Two stations out of, out of four transmitting via statistic multiplexing. So only the two on the first and the third, so it's AC, 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 and so on. No need to send empty slots for the idle ones. All right, and let's continue. <coughs> it's very clear. Wavelength division multiplexing. Wavelength division multiplexing. And we have something called fiber exhaust. A new term. Wavelength division multiplexing, WDM, multiplexes, multiplexes multiple data streams into a single fiber optic line. So multiple streams into a single fiber optic line. It is in a sense frequency division multiplexing technique that assign output sources to separate set of frequencies. Wavelength division multiplexing multiplexes multiple data streams into a single fiber optic line. It is in essence a frequency division multiplexing it's FDM technique that assigns input sources to separate set of frequencies. Wave division multiplexing uses different wavelength or frequency lasers to transmit multiple signals at the same time over a single medium. That's so very smart. The wavelength of each differently colored laser is called lambda. Thus, WDM supports multiple lambdas, so it's FDM over fiber optics using different laser colors. So here we have various types of sources, different frequencies, and WDM multiplexer, and this is fiber optics. Fiber optic line using wavelength division multiplexing and supporting multiple speed transmissions. Multiple speed, so they don't arrive at the same time or they 
they have different bit rates. I think they have different bit rates because the frequency is related to the bit, bit rate and different frequencies mean, means different bit rates. But the speed is the speed of light, so it doesn't really change. But the bit rate changes, so different rates. All right. Different speed transmissions, all right. Dense wavelength multiplexing, D, W, D, M. When W, D, M can support a large number of lambdas, it's often called dense. All right. Coarse wavelength division multiplexing, C, W, D, M is a less expensive technology because it's designed for short distance connections and only has a few lambdas. Course WDM. Few lambdas. With a greater space between lambdas. It has more space. Because the wavelengths are farther apart and not packed as closely together as they are in the DWDM. Lasers used for coarse wavelength measurement can be less expensive and do not require extensive cooling. Do not require extensive cooling. They get overheated. All right. CDM, code division multiplexing, also known as code division multiple access. CDM or CDMA. Code division multiplexing is relatively new technology that can be used extensively by both military and cellular telephone companies, and it's used in mobile communications. Whereas other multiplexing techniques, techniques differentiate one user from another by either assigning frequency ranges or interval bit sequence in time, code division multiplexing allow multiple users to share a common set of frequencies by assigning a unique digital code. So to differentiate, they use different codes to each user. And this is very clear, additional multiplexing techniques. So we have more in details, we have more techniques. A number of multiplexing techniques have appeared in the last several years, all of which are interesting and might have a great promise. Three of these multiplexing techniques are optical division multiplexing, optical spatial division multiplexing, OSDM. The other one is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OF DM. The other one is optical division, optical time division multiplexing, OT DM. The first optical spatial division multiplexing, spatial, it's in space, all allows for multiplexing of bursty traffic, a traffic that comes in burst and is produced by numerous voice and, inter and internet data sources onto op an optical transmission technology that has not supported this kind of traffic well in the past. The second multiplexing technique, orthogonal OFDM, is a discrete multi-tone technology used in DSL system that combines multiple signals of different frequencies into a signal, a single more complex signal. So it combines different, combines different frequencies into a single frequency that is more complex. Before the multiplex signals are combined, each is individually pulse modulated. The phase modulated signals are then combined to create a compact high speed data stream. OFDM is used in applications such as wireless local area network, digital TV, digital radio, and home AC power line transmission. OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. The third multiplexing technique is optical time division multiplexing. It's similar to wave length division multiplexing in that fiber optics, uh, fiber optic cables are used extensively, but 
where wavelength division multiplexing is a form of frequency division multiplexing. OTDM, as its name implies, <coughs> is a form of time division multiplexing. OTDM multiplexer combines the data from each input source into a high-speed time multiplex stream. Share time. Chip spreading codes. That's another term. Sixty four bit length binary codes. All right. Discrete multitone DTM is a multiplexing technique commonly found in DSL systems. DSL, as we have already seen, is a technology that allows high-speed data signal to traverse a standard copper-based telephone line. And this is very obsolete, I believe, right now. Nobody's using it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. We have also seen that the highest transmission speed we can achieve with a standard dial-up telephone line is 56 kilobits per second. 256 quadrature amplitude QAM stream combined into DTM signal for DSL service. So it's QAM. But how many streams? 256 combine, combine into one DMT signal. That's discrete multitone. The real power of DTM is the fact that each of the subchannels can perform its own QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation. Recall from chapter two that a common example of QAM is one that involves a four bit code in which eight phase angles have a single amplitude and four phase angles have double amplitudes. For example, one of the one form of DTM supports 256 subchannels, each of which is capable of 60 kilobit per second QAM modulated stream. So one DTM supports 256 QAM channels, each of which 60 is 60 kilobit per second. All right. Comparison of for, of multiplexing techniques. Now we have comparison. Maybe we have a table here. Advantages and disadvantages of multiplexing techniques. So we have the FDM, the synchronous TDM, the statistical TDM, the wavelength division multiplexing WDM, the CDM, the code division multiplexing, and the discrete multitone. So each one has advantages and disadvantages. And for some reason, they did not put the orthogonal here. FDM. Synchronous TDM, statistical TDM, wavelength division multiplexing, code division multiplexing, discrete. I don't see the orthogonal. Compression to compress data, lose less versus Lucy. Preserve the data. Lucy does not preserve the data. 
Compression is the process of taking data and somehow packing more of it into the same space. Compressing it. Whether it's a form of storage device such as a hard drive or iPod or a medium such as a fiber optics line. Lose loss compression technique, no data is lost. Losey compression technique, some data might be lost. Lose loss compression, run length encoding. One of the more common and simpler examples of lose loss compression is run length encoding. So here it says, how many zeros and how many ones and this says five zeros then one then nine zeros then and that's and so on A compression technique based on run length encoding would compress the zeros by first encoding the runs of zeros. That is, it would start by counting the number of zeros until a binary one is encountered. So that's five zeros. If, if there is no zeros, then a pair of ones, then that pair would be considered a run that contains zero zeros performing this so this pair is zero zeros here no need to write one you just write another number of zeros it means there is just one between them so nine zeros it's nine zeros then we have zero zeros that's one one then we have 15 zeros all right then we have four zeros, it means there is one between them. Then we have zero zeros, it means one, one, and so on. All right, then we just keep going. Losey compression. We talked about the lose less, now it's the losey. All of the compression techniques described thus far have been examples of looseless compression. Looseless compression is necessary when the nature of the data is such that it's important no data will be lost during compression decompression stages. An example of that is the, the program, the text, the image file, the video images, and higher quality audios. We don't want to lose anything, so we use looseless. We are talking about the, the Luzi. One of the Luzi things is the MP3, which is an abbreviated for MPEG, Moving Picture Expert Group, Audio 3, Level 3. It's a common form of audio compression. The Moving Picture Expert has developed. And here we have perceptual encoding. Audio engineers take advantage of these and other facts to compress music through techniques called perceptual noise shaping. So in the music and audio type of data, if two sounds play at the same time, the ears hear the louder one and usually ignores the softer one. Also, human ear can hear sounds only within a certain range, which is an average presumption 20, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Consequently, there are sounds usually occurring in the 
in the extremes of normal hearing range that a human ear cannot hear well or even at all. So they took different advantages of this phenomenon and did the perceptual encoding, and MP3 is one example. And JPEG is another example. JPEG format involves three phases, discrete cosine transformation, quantization, and run length encoding. To perform the discrete cosine transformation, the image is broken into multiple 8x8 eight eight blocks of pixels, where each pixel represents either a single dot of color in a colored image or a single shade of black and white in a black and white image. Each 8x8 eight eight block corresponding to 64 pixels is then subjected to fairly common mathematical routine called discrete cosine transformation. Essentially, what this transformation does is produce a new 8x8 eight eight block of values. These values, however, are now called spatial frequencies, which are cosine calculations of how much each pixel value changes as a function of its position in the block, rather than deal with the mathematics of this process, let us examine two fairly simple examples. So it shows something here, then apply the discrete cosine transformation, we might set up special purposes like the, like the below. Note that many zeros, note the many zeros entries, that the non-zero entry are clustered toward the upper left corner of the block. This is because of the discrete cosine calculation, which in essence depict differences between one pixel color relative to that of a neighbor's pixel rather than the absolute value of a particular pixel color. So compared with its neighbors. The other reason for clustering is this is that image is that this image as noted earlier is one with fairly uniform color that's not a lot of color variations and thus there is a little change as you move away from the upper left corner suppose however that we have an image that has lots of details it will have eight by eight block pixels that widely different values and might look like the following. After applying the discrete cosine transformation to the pixel of this image, we might then have a set of spatial frequencies such as the following. Note that few zeros, zero entries are in this block of spatial frequencies. Let us continue the conversion process by focusing on this block that correspond to the image with lots of fine details. The second image, the second phase in the, in the conversion of an image to a JPEG file is the equantization phase. The object of this phase is to try to generate a more zero entities in the 8x8 eight eight block. To do this, we need to divide each value in the block on the same predetermined number of and disregard the remainders. For example, so disregard the remainders. This, this means it will lose something. All right. A question you should ask at this point, if we perform 64-bit division and toss out the remainders, would we not be losing something from the original image? The answer is yes. Yes, we are losing something. But we hope to select an optimal set of values such that we do not lose too much of the original image. So it's losing. The, th the third phase of the JPEG compression technique is to take the matrix of quantized values and perform a run length encoding on the zeros. But the trick here is that you do not run 
length in code by by the zeros by simply going up and down the rows of eight by eight block instead we take advantage of the fact that we would achieve longer run of zeros if we encode on diagonal as shown in this figure so it starts from the top then start does it like this run length encoding of a JPEG image. What about moving video images, such as those you encountered when you're watching the television or DVD? Does this type of data have a unique characteristic that we can exploit in order to compress file? As it turns out, it does. A video actually, a series of images when these images or frames are shown in rapid succession it appears as if the object and the images are moving in order to make to make it seem as though the movement in a movie a movie projection device or TV displays these images or frames at a rate of approximately 30 frames per second. All right. And this is called MPEG, MPEG, MPEG1, MPEG2, or simply MPEG, are common examples of these, of form of compression. <clears throat> all right business multiplexing in action bill's market is a medium-sized store in town that sells groceries at the checkout counter, one can find 10 point of sale cash registers. The store wants to connect all cash registers to a server in the back room. The back room is roughly 100 meters away from the cash registers. Considering the technologies that have been introduced in the text thus far, there are three possible scenarios of connecting the cache registers to the server room. Connect each cache register to the server using a separate point of sale of line. Each line will be some form of condu conducted medium. Transmit the output of each cache register to the server via some form of wireless signal. Combine all cache register output using multiplexing, then send multiplexed stream to the server over conducted medium line. <coughs> and there will be a comparison. And exploring the pros and cons of each scenario. And then we'll continue. And this is the chapter summary. And the key terms and the review questions and the exercises and look at the exercises, there are too many. And thinking outside the box questions. <coughs> and finally, hands-on projects. Then it's time to go to chapter 6.